the shooting range. In this episode, the new event vehicle also known as the T-18E2 and how to use it. The king is dead? Well, we'll find another one. The story of Leroy Grumman and his deck-based fighters. Hotline. The developers answer questions that you've left in the comments. But first, let's start with one of the most difficult machines to play, but still worth it. Another event tech, the Lorraine, with a 150mm howitzer. The World War II Chronicles event is over. It's time to look at the prizes a little closer. First, let's talk about SPAAG based on the Lorraine 40T, a superstar of the French tech tree. There isn't much left from this famous machine, except maybe for the agility. Everything else is different, and not always for the better. Oh, wait, there's a 155mm howitzer. Forget what we've just said, this one is a monster. It can one-shot anyone to molecules, even if it's a T-64 or a leopard. On the other hand, should you miss, you'll have to wait 20 seconds to fire again. So it'll be hard to fix your mistake. You'll probably get a second chance at long-distance fights. You're not very small, but the opponents also won't be hitting you every single time. However, it will take some time to get used to the ballistics of the model 1950, 155 mm howitzer. Don't hesitate to practice in the test drive or in the custom battles. When you master it, you'll be able to destroy even those who hide behind the hills. Another unusual detail is you've only got two types of ammo, HE shells and smoke ones nothing armor-piercing. And if you want even more challenge, then this machine is definitely for you. Its elevation angles go from minus 5 to 67 degrees, and the weapon is located quite high in the hull. That means that you'll have some difficulties while aiming at an enemy standing lower than you. Though, if he's higher, or you're on the same level, you're good. And if the surface isn't flat, and it's hard to aim, try using the cunning technique of shooting after breaking, when your gun for a split second is lower than usual. Just remember not to shoot point blank, as your explosives are quite powerful. If your HE shell detonates too close to you, you might lose half of your modules. The agility of this SPAAG is quite good, 30 to 35 kph off-road is practically guaranteed. Reverse speed is a little worse, 15 kph, but it will be enough for most of the time. The armor eh, isn't that good. Let's just say that your worst nightmare here is the artillery strike, and you can't run away from the cannon-bearing aircraft, though for the latter ones you do have a small surprise the 20mm MG-151 cannon. This vehicle doesn't seem great at first sight, but if you get used to its limitations, the 155mm howitzer will quickly become one of your best friends. So, how do you play it? First, capture a point. The task at hand is to grab some points and not get shot by the enemy tanks, though this part depends on the map. Make sure that the artillery won't get to you before going in. After that, get cozy somewhere from where you can control the most probable enemy attack routes. Or you can support your mates in their quest to capture the other points. Just remember to keep your distance. And don't forget to surprise these opponents who hide behind the hills, thinking they're safe. Prove them wrong. from the French event tech to the American one.
Eight wheels, one gun, looks like a Mars rover. That's the easiest way to describe this light-wheeled tank. This vehicle is quite unique, and here's why. First of all, it obviously lacks Caterpillar tracks, which means you won't be very fast off-road. If you get at least 30 kph out of a maximum 80, consider it a good day. On actual roads and in urban areas, the situation is a lot better, until the first obstacle comes along. On the other hand, the reverse gets you up to 30 kph fair and square, though there is a catch or two. First, you can't turn on the spot. Second, the radius of the turn is quite large. And third, this vehicle doesn't perform well at inclines. Leave the climbing to tanks with caterpillars and find some lowland or just stick to the flat one. Moving on to more pleasant things, the tank is armed with a 57mm M1 cannon with well-spaced M68 shells and only 4 second reload rate. The ammo is great for piercing pretty much anyone on your BR and the behind armor effect is also quite astonishing. One or two hits should be enough for any target. Moreover, it has a stabilizer. Of course, it can't compete with the one on the Abrams, but hey, yeah, trying to shoot on the move is still better with it than without it. There are, of course, some disadvantages. The turret rotation rate is only 18 degrees per second, so you need to be vigilant at all times and not let anyone flank you. There isn't much armor, about 50 millimeters in front on the average. That's no surprise for a light tank, but how do you survive one-shot blasts like this? You have as many as the five crew members, and it's quite hard to kill them all at once. Moreover, the usual target for your enemies will be the lower glacy plate. That way, they will break the transmission and kill the driver. In that case, just shoot back and set a smoke screen to repair. You have as many as 14 smoke grenades, and you shoot them only one at a time, which will be great for survival and point capturing. And speaking of tactics, forget that you're playing on a light tank and don't rush to capture points. Better use this machine as a support tank behind the front line following your teammates. If you don't like supporting roles, set up some ambushes. This Mars Rover feels great in those. You just need to control the surface around you and remember about your weak armor. And now, a story about the importance of not being an arrogant so-and-so. From the early 20s, when the US military naval aviation was growing like crazy, there were only two major companies which supplied the Navy with airplanes. The biggest American aircraft corporations of the day, Curtis and Boeing. The competition between them was so ruthless that one could write a whole engineering detective novel about that. Deck-based fighters were going one after the other in a battle without rules or conscience. But in 1930, Glenn Curtis died unexpectedly, and William Boeing immediately took advantage of that, kicking the competitor from the decks of the US aircraft carriers. Finally, a monopoly. Now he could laugh about that financial crisis, soon to be known as the Great Depression. Boeing became king of naval aviation. At the same time, in a small workshop of his firm, a young engineer Leroy Grumman was building floats as an outsourcer for the U.S. Navy. Once upon a time, he came up with an original idea of a trapezoidal retractable chassis. How? Who knows? He could have just invented it in his sleep. Anyway, after a while, he approached the Navy command with this idea, and they liked it and proposed it to Boeing, who immediately offered a humiliatingly low amount of money for the patent. But no, 
the offended Grumman refused to sell it for this ridiculous money and decided to create his own aircraft. The chairman and aircraft designers at Boeing were laughing harder than ever at the thought of this little man trying to compete with them. The laugh suddenly stopped, and the Navy took a two-seater fighter scout, the Grumman FF-1, into service. Next strike was even harder. In six months, they got a one-seater version, the F-2F fighter. Not only had it a retractable chassis, it also was a full metal aircraft. Grumman knew what he was doing. After all this time of building floats, all of Boeing went into panic. They mobilized all their financial, engineering, and administrative resources to no avail. And in 1935, Leroy Grumman gave the Navy the new and seriously improved F-3F biplane fighter with a more powerful engine, an enclosed cockpit, and a greater flight range. Boeing couldn't create anything close to that. Of course, the aircraft wasn't perfect. It couldn't cope well with the G-force, and the fuselage was so big that it completely shielded the wingtail from the airflows, and they had to rebuild it. The chassis didn't always retract like it should have done, but mostly it did, and it was the key selling point. Grumman created some more modifications of this plane, but none of them has seen action as the USA entered the war long after they were decommissioned. But that wasn't important. The main thing was that the F-3F put an end to two things on the US aircraft carriers. The biplane fighters and the almighty Boeing and Curtis. Grumman became the absolute leader of the US naval fighter aviation along with his series of CAT fighters right until the F-14 Tomcat, which he created in the 70s, and it served all the way until 2006. Still, Leroy Grumman never forgot the mistakes and the arrogance of his predecessor, which is why he would occasionally do some kind of self-intervention. He would let the others come and work in the area of his excellence, share ideas, and even work together with him. But that's a story for another time. Get ready for the traditional last part of our show, Hotline. Developers answering questions from the comments. The first question was asked by a user with a lot of digits in his nickname. Good video, but will we see the series about the BF-109 too? Hi there mate, we'll try, though there's too much to talk about. We'll see what we can do. A player called YouTube Noob asks, So, after modern tanks, do we go to the future? That sounds highly unlikely mate, since we try to recreate real machines in the game. Anyway, the point at which we'll be over with all the tech from World War II to a modern one and for all nations seems pretty far away for now. Another question comes from the player called Danger Daniel. Can we expect to see GDR vehicles for the German Tech 3, like the T-72M1? Hi mate, that's actually quite possible, but probably not in the nearest patches. And the last very serious message was sent by Arrivederci. I like a cheddar. How very unpatriotic of you to discard mozzarella and parmigiano reggiano for English cheddar. You should be ashamed of yourself. But seriously, hehe, <laughs> good for you. That's it for today. But feel free to write your questions in the comments below. We do read them all and you might see some of them answered in the next episode. If you like what we're doing, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you on The Shooting Range.